Welcome back to the Superstar Roundup. It's been a long time. For all the details regarding that, please check out the comment section below. But for now, let's jump right in. Picking up where we left off, episode 82. This was supervised by two familiar faces, Hiroyuki Itai and Yukihiro Kitano. But it also marks Hirotaka Ni's promotion from key animator to animation supervisor. As a supervisor, he does handle the first half, but this episode is entirely outsourced, aside from the second key animators, which are all in-house Toei staff. As a result, I can't actually go through and attribute scenes to each animator, but I can at least point out the styles of each supervisor and a couple of standout moments. So let's jump in with Ni and take a look at his style. He appears to favour longer faces, with ears being quite tall, and of course his pointy noses are very distinct. On the whole, his work is quite angular, it's a little rough here too, but nothing particularly offensive. Next up is Hiroyuki Itai, who at this point is in my opinion one of Super's strongest supervisors. We've talked about his style in the past, but to reiterate he favours very long jaws, with ears placed quite high up the face, his nose is quite large and round, and the way he draws hair is fairly angular, but each chunk is very thick. He cleans up the highlight of the episode, which is the climax of the fight here between Goku and Toppo. It's a series of looped animations that concludes with some cool effects laid in rotations and ends with a Kamehameha. Though I should note that this particular part is cleaned up by Miyako Suji, the chief animation supervisor. Once all's said and done, it's Kitano's turn to supervise, and while he certainly draws a couple of nice shots of Goku, Beerus looks much more like a dog than a cat. Thankfully, although he remains untouched, the rest of Kitano's iffy art is corrected away by the second key animators and again, Miyako Suji. That wraps up the preliminary tournament, so let's move on to episode 83. This was supervised by Koji Nashizawa from Toei and Paul Año Nuevo and Eugene Asen from Toei Animation Philippines. Tap handled the first half, though the chief animation supervisor Takeo Ide redraws the large majority of it with a little help from Masahiro Shimanuki as a second key animator. Futoshi Higashide also invades this outsourced half by providing the bizarre image battle between Krillin and Basil. It's quite conservative on the whole, but definitely does the job for this type of episode. For the second half, Nashizawa takes over and his style dominates the entire half. As per usual, ears sit low down the jaw, eyebrows are thick and noses are pointy. In a couple of scenes you can also see some indented cheek shading, which is always a plus. Not a lot to talk about here, so let's move on to episode 84, which despite almost being a solo episode from Yoshitaka Yoshima, is in my eyes one of the strongest episodes of this arc so far. While the first half primarily consists of dialogue scenes, the chief supervisor Miyako Suji redraws a large majority of Yoshima's work, leaving things looking pretty nice and polished. But it's the second half that really shines, and it's what elevates this episode for me. Futoshi Higashide animates a rooftop battle between Goku and Krillin, and it really demonstrates this man's knowledge of action animation. He really understands how to manipulate the body, whether it be dodging on the ground or sliding across the floor throwing key blasts. It's executed wonderfully, and really reiterates how Higashide is one of the best animators on the show. With second key animation from the likes of Miyuki Yokoyama and Chu Yung Sir, the second half is also significantly more polished than the first. It also demonstrates something that's been really prevalent in this arc, and that's atmosphere. Whether it be the lighting and the camera work where Gohan bows to Krillin, or just the rain effects during Goku's battle, each scene has a distinct look, and that's something that was missing in the previous arcs. We'll see this a lot throughout the episodes I'm covering today, and it's likely the result of Super's new series director, Tatsuya Nagamine. A lot of his work in the past has had similar visuals. Moving on though, episode 85 is supervised by Sutomo Ono and Osamu Ishikawa. Of course, like any time Ono pops up, it does mean some outsourcing was involved, and in this case it is in the first half. The opening of the episode actually worried me. As Goku and Gohan are flying through the sky, their hair isn't animated whatsoever. It's not a time-consuming process, it's not a difficult process, it's a strange omission that made me wonder whether this was going to be a pretty poor episode. Thankfully, as the opening fight shows, there really wasn't anything to worry about. A Korean animator by the name of Shin Yong Soon handles this section. There's plenty of movement here, cool effects, and honestly, nothing to really complain about. I wonder if the opening, which appears to have been corrected, was perhaps just a second key animator running out of time, or even just an intentional sacrifice in the first place to squeeze every bit of time into the more important scenes. 
As we head into the second half, Osamu Ishikawa takes over supervising and his contributions are mainly found in dialogue scenes. You can see his cute noses and distinctive ears throughout, especially towards the end of the episode. However, the highlight of the half and frankly the entire episode comes from Atsushi Nikaido, an animator who's been on the series for quite some time, but never really stood out to me. Chu Yong Se was the second key animator of this particular scene and was kind enough to identify Nikaido as the original animator. Unfortunately, because it's cleaned up, it doesn't actually help me identify Nikaido's style properly, as the line work is unequivocally choose. Thankfully, the smoke is quite distinct, and we'll see that later in the show. It's a good identifier for Nikaido. On to the next one, episode 86 is supervised by Naoki Tate and two TAP animators, Noel Anionuevo and Joey Kalungian. While the two Filipino supervisors do appear to be in charge of the first half, albeit corrected by Miyako Suji, Naoki Tate's corrections can also be found alongside the work of other animators from within Toei itself. In particular, Kenji Miyuma animates the cool scene between Seventeen and the Poachers. What's interesting is that this scene has been heavily corrected by Tate, to the point where you'd be forgiven for thinking it was him in the first place. Thankfully, Miyuma's effects work gives him away, alongside the general layout of the cut, so he has his independence in spite of the corrections. Heading into the second half, this is where Tate takes over entirely, and produces what is, in my opinion, his best work on the series so far. Not only is it incredibly long, but it demonstrates all of his traits so successfully, and elevates what is typically standard Dragon Ball action into something quite interesting. Before the action really begins, I want to point out the brilliance of this long shot. Conveying any sort of reaction at a distance is especially hard, but it's executed here perfectly. Anyway, onto the action. From the very get-go, you can see Tate breaking form to ping 17 up into the air, and this extends into them exchanging blows too. The smears look great and really convey the speed of the fight. Much like Boo vs Basil, there's actual choreography going on here too. Goku's blocking punches, Seventeen's dodging successfully, there's none of the awkward punching past one another that plagues a lot of Dragon Ball action. I really love the way the fight swaps between different distances, it keeps things fresh while allowing for different details to shine through. This is especially evident as they fly over the ocean. Unfortunately, this does lead into the weakest part of Tate's work here. It strays right into the territory I just mentioned, where characters sort of look like they're play fighting. Nothing's really connecting. It looks a little bit stiff and awkward. Thankfully, it is short-lived, and before we know it, we're seeing a great fisheye effect as Seventeen flies through the clouds before we hit one of my favourite parts. Seventeen hitting Goku, only to be countered by this lightning-fast snap of a kick. Really, really great stuff. It's here that Chu Young Sir takes over for the beam struggle and fist clash in the air. Chu's character art is incredibly on model, but there are elements of Tate in here which speaks a lot about his philosophy as a supervisor. Chu described this section as being his skeleton with Tate's skin, which makes sense as you can see that despite the character art, some of the line work is Tate-esque, or even just the smoke in some places. Just to add yet another animator into the mix here, Miyako Suji's corrections can be found throughout everyone's work here, both Tate and Chu, extending right through to the end of the episode even. But that's it for 86, probably one of the strongest recruitment episodes visually. The animation and art direction complemented one another so well, and again ties into this idea that atmosphere is a big driving force of this arc. Of course, after a big high, we need to bring ourselves back down to Earth, and that takes us on to episode 87, supervised by Shuichiro Manabe and Yukihiro Kitano. Honestly, this is a bit of a nothing episode. The first half is supervised by Manabe, who is actually responsible for the OK fight towards the end of the first half. It's actually the only worthwhile thing here. Takio Ide cleans up a few things here and there, but it's mostly standard stuff. Kitano takes over the second half, and again, very little to talk about here. You have the typical Kitano jank that we're used to at this point, but Ide corrects away the vast majority of it, so it looks fairly fine. Pretty unnoteworthy animation for a pretty inconsequential episode. So moving swiftly on then, episode 88, The Return of Gohan. This is part Studio One Pack and part Toei. For the first half, you have the usual supervisors, Yui Kinoshita and Kusunoki Tomoko, while the second loops us back around to Hiroyuki Itai. 
Despite being outsourced, which in Super tends to make for mediocre animation, the first half is actually quite strong. Gohan and Piccolo's initial fight is a little awkward, and while I'm not a huge fan of Kinoshita's style, this episode does do a good job of showcasing it. Her ears tend to be fairly large and taper down towards the earlobe into almost a point. Her noses are very distinctive, it's kind of hard to put into words, but you can find them across all of her episodes. They're kind of squashed and weird looking. Thankfully, Miyako Suji and Chu Yong Se are here to correct the vast majority of if you work away. In fact, it's Suji who corrects the highlight of this half. Though very short, Krillin and 18 Scuffle is really nicely animated, featuring lots of awesome poses that elevates what is otherwise fairly rudimentary movement. As we head into the second half, Higashide kicks things off with a conservative cut that's absolutely another highlight of the episode. I'll let the clip speak for itself, but what I find most fascinating is the character art outside of Suji's corrections here. While I absolutely stand by most of my presumptions about Higashide's animation, I get the feeling most, if not all, of his artwork in the past was actually cleaned up by other people. It would certainly explain how he was able to animate so much while retaining solid art. I don't know for sure, so I'll be keeping a close eye on his work in the future, but Higashide might be a little less godly than we first thought. Moving on, as Gohan transforms, Hiroyuki Utai takes over. There's not really masses of complex animation here, but it's good enough. Again, much like the first half's opening did for Kinoshita, this section here showcases Itai's style well enough. As I mentioned at the start of the video, you can see the high ears, long jaws, and rounded noses. All in all, a pretty good episode, so let's move on to episode 89 then. This episode is pretty much entirely outsourced, much like episode 82, with Toei Animation Philippines, Mido Doga, Anime R, and several freelancers taking on the vast majority of key animation. While the first half is technically supervised by Joey Kalungian and animated by the guys at TAP, Takeo Ide, the chief animation supervisor, has redrawn everything. And I do mean everything. If you were ever looking to learn his style, you can see it here in all of its glory. I guess if I were to describe it, it's like someone took Yamamuro's style and turned the manliness up about 400%. I'm not the biggest fan, but he has grown on me quite a bit lately. Onto the second half, and Hirotaka Ni takes over supervising. Unlike his last episode, he doesn't actually do any key animation, instead sticking to second KA on top of his regular supervisor role. This does mean the large majority of scenes take on his style, which again we did mention earlier. As the short-lived action begins, the third and final supervisor, Koji Nashizawa, steps up. Not too much to say here other than point out how nicely he draws Tenshi and Han. This episode is a lot like the second 17 episode. It's all a bit nothing, so we're going to move on. Episode 90 then, Goku vs Gohan. This was one of the most hotly anticipated episodes, not just because of its content, but because Hideki Yamazaki, a bigwig from Studio Bones, was involved. He was the chief animation director on Noragami and supervised several My Hero Academia episodes. He was paired up with Masahiro Shimanuki too. This had all of the makings of a great episode. Unfortunately, while the episode was still good, it wasn't anywhere close to what I expected based on the staff list. At the very least, there is a good reason for this. This episode was in production during Golden Week, which if you don't know is a holiday period in Japan where a lot of companies straight up shut down and employees take the whole week off. As a result, this episode was created under some incredibly tough circumstances. There were four assistant supervisors, Takio Ide, Shuichiro Manabe, Koji Nashizawa, and Shintaro Amura. This is on top of contributions from Miyako Suji, the chief animation supervisor, and even Tadayoshi Yamamura, the director of animation for the entire series. From talking to Chu Yong Sir, we know there were only three people in office at one point working on the episode. It was kind of nuts. Speaking of Chu Yong Sir, he's pretty much the star of this episode. He agreed to tackle over 100 cuts in the space of 11 days at the request of the production manager. His work is absolutely the star of this episode, and by his own admission, he really went out of his way to mimic the action in Dragon Ball Z. Similarly, Shijo Yukimasa completed 40 cuts alone. I have no idea what their work looks like, but again, it does speak to the state of the episode. Again, some more insider info here. With only two days to go before the episode was due to air, cuts were still being completed. This was absolutely a crazy mad rush of an episode, but frankly, it 
turned out quite nicely, all things considered. I think that speaks volumes about how far Super has come. Heading into episode 91 now, this is supervised by Yoshitaka Yoshima. As we know, Yoshima solo animates the vast majority of his episodes, with a little help from the odd animator here and there, and this is no exception. While Yoshima does dominate the episode with some cleanup from the likes of Takio Ide and Miyuki Yokoyama, it's Futoshi Higashide and Naoki Tate who animate the most noteworthy scenes. Higashide tackles the fight scene between Goku and Whis in the gravity room. It's fairly conservative, which has become a bit of a trend. He's been on fewer and fewer episodes lately, and when he does show up, the scenes have been on a much smaller scale. I get the feeling he's probably going to deliver some pretty great work at the tournament. Next up is Naoki Tate's scene, he handles the great henshin or transformation for Brienne. Despite Tate's lengthy career, this is his first time ever animating a magical girl transformation. As far as these types of scenes go, it's never going to win any awards, but to pull it off in Super is quite the accomplishment and I think it turned out pretty nicely. It definitely has its own flair to it and I imagine we'll see this repurposed as bank animation throughout the tournament and this won't be the first reused Tate scene as we'll soon see. Moving swiftly on then, since this video is getting pretty long, episode 92. This is part Toei Animation Philippines with Noel Anio Nuevo and Joey Kalungian, and part Toei with Osamu Ishikawa. While there are two distinct halves here, the first being tap orientated and the second being Toei, there's some crossover with Atsushi Nakaido animating the demonstration of Universe 3. You can see his distinctive smoke here that was also evident back in 85. Alongside him you have Miyako Suji and Chu Yong Se serving as the second key animators and it's their style that dominates the vast majority of this half. Heading into the second half when we see Osamu Ishikawa's corrections take over pretty much every scene, it's very clean very polished. There are a couple of hiccups here and there, but on the whole, it's the type of safe work we've come to expect from Ishikara at this point. It's perfect for these low action, high dialogue types of episodes. But with these types of episodes, it does mean I don't have masses to say. We'll move on to 93 then, which is one of my favourite episodes of the arc, despite hating pretty much everything to do with the narrative content. It opens with the outsourced Sutomo Ono led half, which is really animated. From the get-go we've got Kurilin bounding around and there are also more subtle movements like Goku blinking as Vegeta's talking to him or the way his hair bounces as he looks up. It really brings the storyboard to life and makes these lengthy dialogue scenes feel far more interesting than they really are. The same carries over into the scenes with Universe 6. Cauliflower is one of my favourite new characters and I think that comes down to how well she's animated. Her personality is literally drawn onto the screen. The same goes for Kale too. I really I really can't overstate how nicely storyboarded this episode is. As she transforms, we get some bank animation as Tate's scene from the opening is reused and shown in its entirety here. And this leads us into the second half where Shuichiro Minabe takes over and shows us that he's one of Super's strongest assets. There's real energy behind his drawings, whether it be his super sharp explosions, unique smoke or the numerous facial expressions that dominate this fight. When I covered his work in episode 80, I spoke about his exaggerated expressions and they're here in all their glory. Huge mouths fling open at every opportunity and it looks fantastic. He even throws in some great looking impact frames at the end too. He does great work and it made me realise I was probably wrong about this scene back in episode 80. This isn't corrected Higashide, this is pure Manabe. I think I really underestimated him and I cannot wait to see what he delivers at the tournament. Okay, episode 94, this is supervised by Paul Año Nuevo and Eugene Asen from Toei Animation Philippines. Bit of a trend here. It's also supervised by someone who's been missing from the series for even longer than I've been missing from YouTube. This is of course the return of Yuichi Kurosawa. The first half is very dialogue driven and entirely corrected by Miyako Suji, so there's nothing too distinct to cover there. Kurosawa takes over for the second half and the jumping quality is immediate. 
17 and 18's dialogue scene features Kurosawa's fantastic three-tone shading, and this continues throughout the entire episode, whether it be things like Piccolo's cape or just the character's muscles. There's a complexity and attention to detail here that few supervisors attempting this type of style come close to achieving. It's not quite perfect, some facial feature placement is a little off here and there, but I think the quality on the whole is high enough that I speak for everyone when I say, we are so glad to have you back, Kurosawa. This episode of course ends with Frieza's transformation, which was confirmed to be the work of Kyoto Ashikita, who's most well known for his work on the Gundam series. It's unsurprising then that this scene is super snappy with some cool background animation and rotations to lay on the finishing touches. It was great to see so many people acknowledge that this was better than the film's attempt, a wonderful way to wrap up the episode. Continuing the hot streak of terrific episodes then, let's talk about episode 95. The first half is from Studio One Pack and is supervised by Chihiro Tanaka, which actually marks her first time in the lead supervisor position. Usually it's Yui Kinoshita, but strangely she's only an assistant this time around. Takeo Ide is the chief animation supervisor, and much like his work on 89, he corrects almost the entirety of One Pack's half. Usually One Pack's work is serviceable at best, but this half contains what is, in my opinion, the strongest piece of animation in this episode. Now Toshishida was the storyboard artist, and while he does do some key animation that we'll talk about shortly, this particular sequence carries the essence of his work far better than he does here. It's great to see this type of stuff coming from support studios. On to part two, and this is where Naoki Tate begins supervising. Unlike his last episode, he doesn't do masses of fancy animation, but Frieza torturing one of the assassins looks decent enough. Mostly though, he just plays the supervisor role pretty straight, injecting his expressive drawings into the large majority of scenes. As we hit the climax, now Toshishida steps in to deliver his scene. Of all the work he's done on Super, this is his weakest and most conservative, but there is good reason for it. During this period, he storyboarded this episode, animated on this episode, animated on Tiger Mask, and animated on Digimon. He was very, very busy, but at the very least, he compensated for the lack of movement here with some of the most beautiful drawings Dragon Ball has ever seen. So now it's time to head off to the arena. We're finally at the tournament. Episode 96, supervised by Hiroyuki Itai, and from Toei Animation Philippines, we have Joey Kalungian and Noel Año Nuevo. I expected nothing from this episode, yet I ended up with one of my favourite pieces of animation from this arc so far. It is of course the fight between the various gods of destruction. The first section was animated by Kenji Miyuma, who's got these super cool chunky angular effects. He throws in some background animation and the short hand to hand section is really smooth, it's very nicely done. It then swaps over to Atsushi Nikaido who delivers the beam clash. I love the timing of Owen's section. His beam kind of pops out of his hand and slides along the ground. It's really snappy. I really, really like it. Moving back to Earth, this is where Hiroyuki Itai's corrections are at their strongest. Again, the high ears, long jaws, and large noses are in full view. I really like how his work looks. It's a nice and clean interpretation of Yamamura's character designs. We've seen it work in dialogue scenes. We've seen it work in action. Itai is absolutely a worthy addition to the series. The second half is where Tap takes over, and while Suji's corrections help things here and there, the work is mostly untouched, so this definitely seems like one of the weaker looking sections in this arc so far. Chances are Suji's very busy ensuring the tournament looks as good as we would like it to. But that is it. We are caught up Finally, as much as disappearing for many months has meant that this episode contains the highest number of accurate confirmations, it also means that this took forever to write, over 4,000 words covering 15 episodes. I really, really hope you guys enjoyed this. The tournament begins next week. I'm so anxious to see what they'll manage to pull out of the bag. This arc has looked so strong for 20 episodes in a row now. I really hope they can keep it up. Let me know what your expectations are for this tournament and how you've been enjoying this arc so far. I will do my very best to keep on top of things, but as always, if you do want information then and there, be sure to follow me on Twitter, as well as checking in on the Kanzenshi thread from time to time. Thanks for watching, I am so sorry this has been so delayed. Again, if you want a full explanation, please do read my comment down below, but for now, I will see you next time.